In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about the relation between disgust and morality. So here's another example. So if you get people to spit into a, to, you know, to put saliva into a cup, they will not take it back in their mouth. Well, and you think, well, that's kind of strange too. It's like, you know, the cup is sterilized. We'll say, you know, it's sterilized. Well, it was just in your mouth like half a second before. What the hell's wrong with it now? And the answer is, it's no longer in your mouth. And, you know, so there's an, there's an identification of the exterior of the body envelope as one of the things that defines you and not you. And, you know, the immune system, per se, is always defining you and not you, getting rid of things that aren't you and keeping the things that are you, and that's extended out to our behavior. So you can get... Here's the sorts of things that Jonathan Haidt has been uh, d discovering. Haidt was really the guy who did the first you know, major work on disgust. It's a big deal, man, like two thumbs up for him. Um, he's discovered something genuine. Inducing disgust responses, whether via a foul order, a dis odor, a disgusting work environment, or recalling a disgusting experience, led individuals to assign harsher punishments to others who had committed moral transgressions. So that's interesting, because what it also means is that the sense of disgust, at least in part, is at the core of what we might describe as our desire for justice. So, which we tend to think is a primarily cognitive thing, but most of the things that we, we do and hold dear are not primarily cognitive. They're grounded in, you know, phenomena that are deeply embedded within us. Harsh moral judgments can even be induced following the consumption of a bitter drink. Well, <coughs> poisonous things are often bitter even though bitter things are sometimes not poisonous. And the bitter flavor evokes disgust. The same disgust-related facial expressions are observed in response to unpleasant tastes, disgusting photographs, and receiving unfair treatment in, in an economic game. So that basically means that if you're playing, imagine some kids are playing together, and one of the kids cheats. Well, you might say, well, the other kids are going to be angry, or the other kids are going to be upset, or the other kids are going to be anxious because they've upset the structure of the game. It's like, okay, maybe all those things happen. But one thing that happens as well is disgust. It's like, how could you do that? And then, of course, if you're disgusting, the probability that you're going to get shunted out of the dominance hierarchy altogether is pretty damn high. Concerns about cleanliness and feelings of disgust have likewise been related to political attitudes. Situal, situational reminders of the importance of physical cleanliness, such as asking participants to wipe their hands with antiseptic wipes, tends to increase self-reported political conservatism. Such a finding is consistent with the notion that purity tends to be valued more highly by conservatives than by liberals. Well, for much of human history, female virginity in particular was highly valued. And sometimes the punishments for deviating from that were, and still can be, extraordinarily high. Well, part of the reason why you might ask, why precisely is that? And part of the reason is an exaggerated disgust response. Individuals who report being disgusted more easily also tend to hold more conservative political views on topics including abortion, gay marriage, tax cuts, and affirmative action. In addition to the effects that have emerged when using self-reported disgust sensitivity, more conservative political views have also been associated with stronger physiological reactivity to disgusting images. Yeah, so preferences for order on, and tradition on the one hand and preferences for egalitarianism on the other appear to be integrally related to two core dimensions of moral value. And so the um, preferences for order and tradition are associated with higher levels of orderliness and politeness as well as lower levels of openness and intellect, and preferences for egalitarianism are uniquely associated with compassion, an aspect of agreeableness. Political conservatism, now this is where the claims get frightening, I think. Political conservatism can be thought of as a social immune system, reflecting the extension of pathogen avoidance mechanisms to the integrity of the social system. Just as the behavioral immune system has been conceptualized as helping to maintain the purity and integrity of an individual body, so too may the same pathogen avoidance system help to maintain the abstract integrity of the social order. In particular, the social immune system would help to maintain order by suppressing any actions or individuals that deviate from a group's accepted social traditions. Okay, now, we're going to make a bit of a segue here from this. 
It has been reported, for instance, that, that regions with higher levels of disease prevalence tend to be associated with higher levels of social conformity and autocratic rule. Individuals who feel more vulnerable to disease likewise report higher levels of ethnocentrism and xenophobia. Now, that's something else to consider. So, I don't know if you know this, but when the Spaniards landed in Central America, they had been from a European population that was concentrated in cities, and the cities were, from our perspective, disgusting, filthy, close proximity with animals, and subject to continual waves of epidemic disease. Now, the upside of that for the Europeans was that all the ones that didn't die developed immunity to these various diseases, even though, you know, I would suspect that over time it was the majority of people who did, died from one epidemic disease or another. Well, so then the, the Spaniards went to the New World. Well, for one reason or another, there were hardly any epidemic diseases in North America. Now, that was partly because of a relative dearth of domestic animals and partly because there weren't as many big, closely packed cities. But, you know, God only knows what the overall reason was. So what happened? All the Native Americans died. 95% of them. They died from smallpox. They died from measles. They died from mumps. They died from chickenpox in successive waves of epidemic demolishment centered in Central America and radiating out all across North America and South America. So that by the time the Europeans landed in, because the Spaniards got there, say, in the late 1400s, right? Early 1500s. And so the, the people who landed at Plymouth Rock, and that's kind of often what you think about as the beginning of the European colonization of North America, that was like 100 years later. Well, everyone was dead by then. And there are reports that when the, when, the, when the white settlers, the religious escapees really, landed at Plymouth Rock, the natives were happy to see them because there weren't enough people left to bring in the crops. So, so why am I telling you this? Well, and in return, syphilis was delivered to Europe. At least that's the theory. Although it's not, you know, there isn't any certainty about that, but it seemed to appear at about the same time. So the Europeans brought endless numbers of horrible diseases to the New World, and then the New World returned the favor with one horrible disease. But there's a point here. Well, and still, this still happens. So if you go into the Amazon, you find a tribe that, you know, hasn't been discovered yet, or anywhere else in the world, and you go up and you shake their hand, it's like, that's great, but they're all dead in like a month. So, so why is this important? Well, we don't know how often this sort of thing has happened in the past. And so it could easily be the case that Part of the reason that people are leery of people who aren't like them is because over our evolutionary, the course of our evolutionary history, it was at least moderately probable that you ran, if you ran into another group of people, even if they didn't kill you and you immediately went to war, that the mere contact would devastate you. You know, and you could imagine how that sort of thing would be attributed to things like magical power or curses or, you know, whatever have you, when people are trying to strive for an explanation for the phenomenon. 